Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for being with us tonight and experiencing this film together. Um, I remember the first time I saw this film, I just sat and watched the whole thing through. I was just absolutely transfixed and um, just couldn't look away. And it's really nice to experience it with other people all together and to be in dialogue with you tonight. How are you feeling, Tuan? I'm feeling grateful and honored and thank you all for being here tonight and i just want to say <clears throat> before we start the conversation i want to thank you vivian for for everything and for being so thoughtful and generous and nurturing in this whole process it's been amazing sorry i'm a little bit uh, emotional tonight. that's that's a good thing yeah i mean it's it's such a complex and beautiful work and um, I would love to just talk a little bit about um, the broader context for this film and your research on Quan Chi and um, just for those who may not be familiar with how this project came about if you could share a little bit about the process behind it it's the longest film you've made to date Techni technically no but right. the mm -hmm. other film um, rests in a secret place. Um, We're gonna dig that up later. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I, I wanna say also that it's, there's a lot of reading for those who are non-Vietnamese speakers, and I'm sorry for that. And some of the subtitles flash very quickly. And there's a lot of nuance in the language um, that cannot be, uh, conveyed through subtitles so i'm very very sorry for that um if i had in my way we'd all have like those star trek uh translators and we understand it to me if we had it our way we'd be dubbing the film together you the whole be. thing would be in the back dubbing <laughs> the film <laughs> that would be amazing let's do that next time yeah we'll, we'll work on it yeah, stay tuned yeah um so uh, actually i was before the pandemic, um, I was traveling around a lot, working with different communities in different places um, with my good friend and my cinematographer who's here tonight, Andrew Yu Yi Trung, who's sitting up. You stand up. Just because I have to say this because. Team Andrew. Yeah. Um, we were traveling all over doing films in very many, like different places. And it was actually the pandemic. And you know all the travel restrictions that that stopped all of that. That um, kind of gave me a space to kind of re rethink um, the situation in Vietnam. I mean, I've been ex very interested in, in UXO. I had brought this idea to the table when we were working as a collective. I'm also part of a collective called the Propeller Group. And we were kind of looking at the kind of relics of the Cold War, specifically the Vietnam War. We were um, researching, you know, the design and the and the creation of assault rifles, namely the AK-47 and the M-16, which really comes out of this moment in the Cold War um, and how it's kind of affected the many wars since. Um, and UXO was something that I was quite interested in. Um, but, you know, it was, uh, it was a busy time in the propeller group's kind of um, trajectory. Um, so when the pandemic happened, I kind of refocused my energies to Wang Chi and began flying because we could fly within the country. Um, so I began visiting Wang Chi a lot. Um, got a chance to follow one of the three or four NGOs that were operating in Guangxi. Um, and we, I got to follow them on a um, demining mission where they um, diffused a 16-inch uh, 50 caliber, like one-ton bomb in, in the hills of Guangxi. And, um, you know, it was... It was a an eye opening experience, and all the people I talked to in Guangxi were extremely incredible people because of the resilience, the, you know. And I learned a lot. And um, several trips later, we we made multiple kind of 
pieces out of this research. Yeah. I wanted to unpack that a little bit more to think through, I mean, you research very deeply and you research over extended periods of time. We've talked a lot about kind of research as a mode of listening, of absorbing, rather than the kind of consuming of knowledge. And then there's this kind of generosity in the way that you share out that knowledge back. And by using this kind of framework of a kind of semi-fictive, but really based on real stories and through a kind of collaborative process, something like this emerges and we are absorbing so much information about yeah there's a lot of information these these people this region and it's important to note that the people in this film are not actors like you're allergic to the word actor like they're you know you use the word they're collaborators they're agents they're in many ways enacting their own stories and i think that piece is really important in the context of understanding this film and your practice more broadly. Right. Um, I mean, specifically, Hovan Lai, the young man who who is a victim of UXO, he's actually, this is what he does now. He works at an NGO called Project Renew. It was started by an uh, um, incredible man named Chuck Searcy, um, who was a Vietnam War veteran. Um, and Ho Van Lai finds a lot of meaning in the work that he does now. Um, and so his story is, is his real story, and he's playing himself in the film. Um, and, and for me, that, that matters a lot. Um, because I think when people have agency in telling their own story, there's there's a connection that happens with that person and the viewer. Um, I, I, I always say that, you know, storytelling is a very powerful form of political resistance, like to tell a story, to make sure that a story is not forgotten or buried away is a very strong political act. But I also think that, you know, when we sit down and we listen to a story that is the beginning um, towards finding empathy with someone and it's the beginning of a, a true kind of solidarity that can happen. And so when we sit down here as people who are watching this film, that's what I am hoping can happen. We were listening to stories like Lai's story told by Lai himself. Um, that's the kind of space that I hope can be opened up by this exchange. Right. And I mean, I mean, I think your broader practice in general is resisting um, the violence of the archive, the archive in photographic form, in um, film footage, and so much of that is the fact that the people who are often portrayed or documented are not telling their own stories. They're not speaking um, for themselves. And, you know, I think part of your resistance to a so-called kind of official history is this focus on the unofficial, the untold stories. And a lot of that is also done through this kind of intergenerational storytelling and the interpersonal um, effects of these kind of macro histories, right? Like these massive events that we understand statistically, but not necessarily understanding the kind of real trauma the real kind of impact of that and there isn't really a question there but I wanted to talk a little bit about yeah the way you approach your work through that and it's very evident in this film and the relationship between yeah and her mother as protagonist of the film but also in the projects that we're showing alongside this work which are very much in dialogue with the unburied sounds of a troubled horizon. So upstairs, there's a four-channel installation of the specters of ancestors becoming, and then this new film that was um, created for this exhibition called "Because No One Living Will Listen," um, looking at the history of Tigrillas, these colonial soldiers who um, were made to fight for the French in other colonial territories, and the kinds of histories that emerge out of that. So. Um, Across your projects, there's this kind of sense of the intergenerational weight 
of history and bringing the past into the present in a very kind of real way, but also in this kind of speculative approach, allowing for a possibility of transformation and healing in the present and in the future as you yeah, embark on the storytelling with your collaborators. Yeah. <clears throat> so the specter of ancestors becoming is a four channel video installation that was made in collaboration with the Vietnamese Senegalese community in Dakar. It was um, there was a migration of Vietnamese women and children after the French were defeated in Vietnam in 1954. Um, for those who haven't seen it, um, and there's a scene written by um, Mary Bay Juf, one of the last scenes in the film where she's, she's rewritten a scene, a conversation between her and her grandmother, who was a Vietnamese woman. Mary Bay um, is mixed race. Her father is half Vietnamese, half Senegalese, and Mary Bay is then, you know, a quarter or something like that. But Mary Bay is a, is a spoken word artist. She's a poet. She's a writer. But she writes this really beautiful line. She says, from her mother's point of view, her grandmother's point of view, she says, I want you to remember so that I can forget. And you can say that in French of you. <laughs> Don't put me on the spot. <laughs> um, but I think that's, that's it. Um, because, you know, I'm really fascinated by this idea of post-memory, like the, the traumas, the intergenerational traumas that we inherit um, even though we haven't experienced that trauma that our, you know, that the previous generations have um, gone through, and it's it's funny actually. Sorry, I'm I'm kind of rambling. But last week we sh we showed this film in um, in LA at the Mocha, and there's a man that told me about his um, his father who who had, um, I think, uh, survived the Holocaust, but he wouldn't speak about it. And, and you know, I, 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 I witnessed that a lot with older generation Vietnamese people. They don't want to speak about the traumas that they've gone through in fear that the traumas would be inherited. They just remain silent. A lot of the, the Vietnamese mothers in Senegal would try not to speak of Vietnam. But I think, you know, that's the complexity of intergenerational trauma. Um, and that's, that, that's what, I'm, I, I don't know, that's what I'm trying to kind of look into. Yeah. And, and I mean, and you're doing it, it with like all of your projects. And I think even those terms like forgetting, remembering, these are recurring words that appear in in the project we just saw. Um, but in general, I think two ideas that kind of come out of this, one being reincarnation as this kind of way of thinking about the inheritance of memory, of experience, and also, you know, I I'm not we're not gonna leave this without using these these words that we've been talking about so much, like Marion Hirsch's concept of the testimonial object and this idea of the kind of effective charge, the way that objects, materials um, hold history and memory as well, and the way you're working through that in your various projects. Yeah. Um, Sorry, got to sure. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's good to talk about in, 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 in the region where I'm from, um, and many regions across the world, um, there's a strong belief um, that objects have a soul, have a spirit. Um, and I find it interesting because it kind of sits as a counterpoint to like Western rationalism where the object and the subject have been completely disconnected from each other. Um, whereas, you know, when one kind of believes animistically, um, up, like. Right, <laughs> objects. There is no differentiation between object and subject, um, and I find that quite fascinating. Um, and and it's all these beliefs and animism that led to this 
other belief called reincarnation, um, which I'm fascinated with. You don't have to subscribe to the idea that we we die and then we become other people. You don't. But as a narrative device, as a narrative device, what it does for me is that it totally disrupts um, our linear thinking and then it creates loops. Linearity is out the window. And when you've made a space for loops to happen, then a lot of things that we take for granted get upended. Um, like Calder possibly being reincarnated as a scrap yard owner making moguls out of bombshells. Like that is in the speculative fiction, I'm not even saying you have to believe in reincarnation. I've said that twice already. But as a narrative device, no need to right? <laughs> as a narrative device, it's like, could, could there's a there's a little potentiality there, um, and I I think that's fascinating as as a strategy to kind of help us all possibly consider the possibility of really being interconnected. Like I could have been um, your mother in a previous life. You could have been someone who shot me on the battlefield in a, in a previous life, or we could have been husband and wife in a previous life. It could, you know, like the possibilities are in this. So like I've tried to kind of explain that to a white, white supremacist. It didn't work, but like, I mean, that would be the, the dream, like to get him to like subscribe to the idea of reincarnate. And then, wow, I was like, okay. We'll see what happens to him. In and the white life. supremacy via reincarnation. But anyways, I was, yeah. But that's, yeah. But I, I mean, even that, the way that you use reincarnation as a narrative device informs, I think, your approach to this kind of, this dialogical approach that a lot of your work takes on, like the way you use dialogue as evidence in this film and in your other projects, um, but also a kind of dialogue across space time. So that dialogue exists in all these different iterations in your projects, including like in our conversation in the book that you should buy from the bookstore, um, where we go kind of more in depth into these themes. Um, there's this kind of idea that we talk about as like the, a monument as a kind of dialogue between the past and the present. And um, yeah, just all those things seem very much connected and connected to this idea of kind of animism and reincarnation and um, the effective charge of objects is also your interest in replicas which have existed in your works across um, various projects over the years. And I would not at all call what happens with the kinetic sculptures in this work replicas, but I think in some ways they are also a kind of response to um, the canon. <laughs> like in the, your, your attempts at kind of destabilizing um, what is considered a kind of authentic or important or like, you know, disrupting hierarchies in a broader sense. <laughs> is that a question? I, I, I mean, there's no, there's no question mark. <laughs> is that a this question? Is a conversation. Right, right. I'm trying to converse. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, do you? I mean, I I like it. I mean, when we first started talking about this film, and you were like, "Yeah, Twan, you don't totally decanonize like Alexander Calder," um, which I I thought was. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, <laughs> I mean, the conversation in uh, the scene in the film where Wit kind of proclaims to her mother that I am the reincarnation of Alexander Calder, and and then her mother says, "You don't have to be a famous white man artist to to be someone important." Um, so there's this like, like, how can you be called? You're not even a good daughter. Like exactly, it's like. <laughs> Like, and, ouch. <laughs> and Vietnamese mothers say that all the time. Um, but it's like this macro, micro thing that's happening in th that conversation for me where she's like trying to uh, 
with the the main protagonist is like thinking big, you know, like she's just thinking, pulling pulling in all these references, like from Western art history, even and the war and all this stuff. And then her mom's like, "What about our relationship?" You know, like, and those two things have to exist within um, with each other, um, within the framework of one another. And 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 that goes back to your question earlier about the macro and the micro and how. For me, it's very important, after all the research and the history, it's more and most important to kind of hear the stories of people who lived through it. Because that's how we experience history. We experience it through our bodies, through how we've moved about in the world, through the relationships we've had, through the the traumas we've inherited and through the traumas we've we've caused other people um and you know we read these textbooks and we understand like the big picture but that does not give us any kind of entry point into really understanding the suffering and the challenges that real people went through it doesn't help us empathize um so for me to kind of i'm i'm fascinated with the potentiality of empathy as as a thing as a practice as a practice and as your approach to the kind of archival work you do and the research based work you do um i also wanted to talk about um so you're you're seeing here an example of one of these yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've had pictures the whole time behind you. <laughs> um, so this is an unexploded ordinance, and um, yeah, this is the the mission that I got to uh, follow. This is the sixteen inch fifty caliber um, projectile that was shot from the USS uh, U.S. Navy Seventh Fleet. It was a very strong naval force, world renowned, feared amongst everybody. Um, and they would just shoot from the sea um, these like ton heavy one ton bombs um, into the land into land. And I'm connected to this film that we saw tonight. There's another project that also is about this mission that you went on, right? That's called the Sounds of Cannons. Familiar, familiar like, like sad refrains. It's, it's a t taken from a s title by um, a singer songwriter. Uh, named Jin Dong Sung. I borrowed that title because the song I, we used the song in that film. It's a two-channel film, particularly about the mission where um, this bomb is basically put to an end. The bomb meets its death, so to speak, and it the bomb is speaking like the bomb. It we hear it's history, yeah, yeah, from the bomb's um, point of view. So the bomb is the narrator of that two channel. Um, maybe we should have well next time, but <laughs> we should have we should have showed that as a. But and then the bomb kind of reconsiders its own death and its own possibility of reincarnating into something else. So the film, the unburied sounds. This whole project in Guangxi really kind of looks in parallel, like the uh, the idea of a spiritual reincarnation and a material reincarnation. What can these materials, when they're reincarnated, um, reconfigured, what can they be? So the, the proposal that I'm putting forth is that these objects that were designed for the purpose of killing and destruction can then be turned and transformed into these objects that can heal. And, and that's what Nguyet discovers in her journey, in, in her personal story and even i mean throughout the film and in the sounds of cannons there's this kind of sense that these unexploded ordinances are also kind of showing compassion like that the fact that they didn't explode is this kind of intentional desire to to prevent death um right and that story but when the muck is talking about the b-52 carpet bombing raid where the two that's a real story yeah, and that's very kind of animistic, you know. 
um, imbuing this like compassion, this ability to be compassionate in the object of the bomb was for me like so fascinating. Yeah. And you're um, you're the ghost artist in that film in the sense that the objects that appear in that film are made by you. Well, I'm embodying Nguyet, who's embodying Calder, so that I'm twice removed. Yeah, you, you stole my line, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully the Calder Foundation doesn't knock on my door, but they can knock I mean, on Nguyet's door. If they want to knock on your door with <laughs> um, dollar signs. <laughs> but yeah. But I, I mean, and I, yeah, I, actually, I, I won't say that for the record. <laughs> I'll say this offline later. Um, but I, I love that, yeah, we are showing this film alongside some of your more recent works, including works that you've made since this film um, was completed. And again, like what you used basically stole my line, the question I was going to ask, which is around this kind of like idea of you embodying yet and like still kind of performing the kind of, you know, the process of creating these incredible mobiles out of actually like the bomb metal and artillery shells and um, and then tuning them to these frequencies. Um, and for those who haven't been upstairs, we shipped a bomb back from Vietnam to the US. Yes, we did. M117. That, it, that in itself is a It's such an incredible act of like, take take this back like take this back and freaking keep it <laughs> you know um but then yeah when you play it i mean the sound is, is so incredible and i would love to hear some about like the process of you um coming into making this work and yeah it relates to the film yeah there's there's not very many people in Vietnam who were thinking about frequency and sound healing um but we were lucky enough to meet a uh, a young man um named Duc Tran um and he has a company called Do France um where he makes these wind chimes and he makes sure that they're kind of tuned to these frequencies and um I kind of apprenticed under him like he taught me a lot um watching him do it and then you know talking about the science behind frequencies and 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 all of this and it was very fortunate because we were in the pandemic and i had a lot of time to kind of research and, and practice and uh eventually you know learn how to tune these pieces of metal to these frequencies yeah really incredible and that's another plug for you to come on saturday to see the activations of the sculptures i'm really looking forward to witnessing that um and yeah i wanted to also talk about the importance of music in your work um now that you're a defunct uh reggae performer oh, you <laughs> did sorry. not have to I go did, there. i did i did i brought it up <laughs> No, but I think in general, from the beginning, from your time in the propeller group, music has been so important to your work. And I think because music is able to convey so much, and I think especially, um, I will not butcher the pronunciation of the composer, but, um, you know, hearing... Bin Kong, Ang, Bin Ang. Oh, uh, Jin Kong yeah, San. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but in hearing Kong Di's voice in this film and the sounds of canon, I mean... Her voice, it's just such an incredible voice that kind of frames the film and really sets the tone for the film and the kind of emotional resonance that it has, pun intended. Yeah. I was talking to um, an artist named Jamie Ross yesterday, and we were talking about sound, and he does a lot of work with sound and singing. And I was saying that, you know, Scents like smells trigger your olfactory thing, and then it has a really direct relationship to memory. Um, but I think for me and for a lot of people, sounds have that effect. Like you hear a kind of sound or a voice, and it triggers memory. Um, and I grew up listening to my parents listening to Jin Kong Sun and Kang Lee. 
And Jin Kong San was a very kind of significant um, composer during um, the American War in Vietnam. He was kind of censored in the South because he was singing anti-war songs. And then after the end of the war, he was censored by the North. Um, but he wrote, it's, it's, you know, I've tried this many times to kind of translate his lyrics. His lyrics are such beautiful, luscious, kind of poetic um, lyrics. And then paired with the, the kind of ominous, haunting, yet piercing and melancholic sounds of Kang Lee. It, it just becomes this thing that triggers a generation, like my parents' generation, um, instantly. Um, and because I grew up listening to them, listening to Jin Kong Sang, it, it triggers me too. And it's very much kind of tied to this, this time. Yeah, and this, this, this war. Um, and, you know, we talked about dance and we talked about, um, yeah, for me, also, I mean, I, as the Propeller Group, we were, you know, we were a, an advertising company and a film production company. So, and we, we did a lot of music videos. I mean, that was our bread and board butter for some time. And so making music videos was also something that was, um, informed my kind of understanding of image and sound. Um, it was like my, my, my training in a way. Um, that helped lead me to these things, these projects here. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, it's very present in the specter of, of ancestors becoming as well. I mean, music is is very much there. Um, we have we have time for questions now. So that's a very like <laughs> abrupt halt. Um, <laughs> just want to make sure we have time to open up for other people and yeah, hear a little bit from folks hi we have our first we have our first question here in the front live in la vida loca just joking i don't know how that came into my mind <laughs> hi thank you so much that was a beautiful sure. film that you just showed um i think my question is like multi-pronged uh, but it does have to do with the music, and especially with Kenley and Jin Kong Sung. I thought it was a beautiful opening for that. Um, I do know that Jin Kong Sung was very much an existentialist in his training, and then later on became a huge phenomenologist. And so in a lot of the lyrics, um, he tends to leave out pronouns. So it's kind of hard to translate. So one of my first questions is like a question of translation for you. This is like obviously like a visual translation of all the things you're trying to do. And Obviously, with like a colonial history in a country like this, there's a lot of reworking. And so I grew up in Vietnam, actually. So when I see like places like this, I mean, we call them like cemeteries, essentially, because you're recycling dead things. So that, I thought that that part was really beautiful. But there seems to be like a strange contradiction here because his whole thing about the not having pronouns in the lyrics is sort of like the arrival towards absence, right? It's like the sort of it's the self-effacing part of song lyrics, which typically is not the case in Vietnamese lyricism, because I think with whichever pronoun, you can actually switch between the male and the female, whereas with Jen Kong Sang, you actually can't really do that. So that's why Kenley, I think, works really well for that. So I'm wondering between that versus like the drive towards recycling, which seems to be propelling new life as opposed to just getting rid of life. Um, and then in the actual Vietnamese, um, sorry, I'm trembling just a little bit, uh, but in the actual, uh, sorry, in the one of the dialogues, she actually refers to the Vietnam War as um, uh, Chiang Tran Vietnam. No, uh, Chiang Tran Vietnam. But in, in Vietnam, at least from my understanding and yeah. the way that was taught, is Chiang Tran Mei. Yeah, Mei. So, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if that's a direct translation from English. And so, in that sense, is the script also was originally written in English and then translated, or was it written originally in Vietnamese and then translated into English? Um, but so there's sort of three questions together. That was three questions. So like, you do must you want to switch seats? Like, you're <laughs> please. You are you an academic somewhere? Where Where do you teach? At Bar and in what department? If you don't mind me asking. 
Okay. Vietnamese in French? Yo, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, thank you for that amazing question. Um, I only registered one question, so I will answer that question first. Yes, that, that scene where she's telling her mother, yeah, and then he, 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 he um, was very much uh, concerned with the Vietnam War. She says, Jin Chan Việt Nam. Um, and that's something that within our small team, we kind of debated quite a lot. Um, and we opted for this kind of strange, it's a moment where actually the camera flips and it moves, it dollies from um, over the shoulder mom, over the left shoulder of mom to over the right shoulder of mom. And so what happens when you cross that, that line, when you're cutting between mom and daughter, um, they kind of are situated in the same position. They're looking the same way and they kind of start looking the same. Um, but it's also this moment where she says, he, and then the camera moves, or maybe I just wanted to do something different. And so because of that, we ended up keeping Vietnam War as if it was spoken from the perspective of Calder. Um, we were also thinking that, you know, these people always ask me, like, why Calder? Um, but there, there are some kind of coincidences with time that I think were quite um, serendipitous uh, for, for the context and the storyline. Calder dies November 11th, 1976. He was very adamantly vocal about the war in Vietnam, the American war in Vietnam. And so there's, you know, in, in Buddhist thought, when your psyche, when your, your, your kind of mental space is kind of leaning towards a, a, a topic or a subject or a geography, then it's very kind of plausible that your spirit reincarnated soul come, you know, travels there. Um, so that's why we opted for it. And that's very perceptive of you. Thank you for bringing that up. That's why we opted to keep it the Vietnam War. And I think another piece that I'm I'm um, grasping from this very beautiful comment and question is even the kind of gender slippage, the kind of non-assigning there yeah. that um, they're speaking to um, is also tied into this kind of slippage between identity and that fluidity and reincarnation. So. Totally. I mean, that's also a super perceptive, <laughs> perceptive comment. Yes. Yeah. Um, in relationship to how the music is also functioning. Completely. In this film as well. And, you know, one of the many ways we've bonded was over, you know, we've made some allusions to it, like um, these various experiences we had as migrant children born in another country and then experiencing um, U.S. culture um in our places of origin but also you know consuming it as like migrant children based here and this kind of idea of dubbing and like the way that you've used ventriloquism in a lot of your other works which is to say like you have someone mouthing something and then the audio is actually coming from elsewhere and there's a kind of the interplay that happens there and one thing that always fascinated me, like watching The Sound of Music on Brazilian TV for the hundredth time, because it was like apparently the only film that was like licensed and <laughs> on TV, like seemingly weekly, is like the songs were never dubbed. The songs were never dubbed because like they couldn't they couldn't even try to like replicate what it's like to sing the lyrics and to express those lyrics. Like that's when they'd phone it in and be like, okay, subtitles for that part. Um, Cause or else you'd have the same dubbing actors trying to sing like Julie Andrews. Like no one needs oh, that. <laughs> my dear, a female dear Ray. Can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Hi, Dong, it's me again. Hi, Yui. It's my second time seeing this, and uh, I'm not ugly crying this time, so that's an, that's an improvement. Um, beautiful film, and um, 
earlier you were talking a little bit about language. I kind of want to come back to that and kind of unpack. Um, so during the film, um, there's a part where we went to the monk and they were having a conversation about uh, reincarnation. And two words came to mind. Um, first word, Dao Thai. In Vietnamese, it has more to do with the, the actual physical manifestation um, via the, the act of birthing. And then there's Luang Hoi, which is also um, more of like a spiro- uh, spiritual uh, manifestation. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious. A, a spiritual kind of... In- right, returning. Yeah. Right. And so I'm, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more um, about reincarnation in the context of those two words and how um, sort of your take on reincarnation as a plot device um, to sort of address the sort of the, the, an effort to heal uh, from intergenerational trauma. The the choice between Dao Thai and Luang Hoi. Okay, we're gonna lose a lot of audiences here, but let's let's go for it. I'm just joking. Let's get into oh. it. Let's get I think into even the beat. synchronicity of when you were filming this film and the kind of the inspiration of this monk figure that you we haven't quite addressed here, but I think yeah. it's important to think through. Maybe that helps you answer that. Yeah, maybe I'll answer that in a roundabout way, um, anecdotally. Um, we were shooting in Guangxi, which is about 20 kilometers away from Phong Dien. And Phong Dien is a part of Hue, the old original you know, citadel city. Um, but Phong Dien is also very well-known because a very famous, world-renowned Zen Buddhist monk comes from Phong Dien. His name is Thich Nhat Hanh. Some of you might have heard of him. And kind of famous. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant um, thinker, just all-around brilliant thinker. Um, and that scene with the monk was very much kind of based on some of the teachings um, that Thich Nhat Hanh had given. Um, but it was funny, on our last day of shooting, and Andrew remembers this, we were in the car, and my, uh, one of my close collaborator, collaborators, Nguyen Xuan Phuong, um, and I say Nguyen Xuan Phuong because uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's name is Nguyen Xuan something. It, he's from Phong Dien too. And we got this message that um, Thich Nhat Hanh had just passed away. And so he just passed away you know, about 20 kilometers from where we were on our last day of shooting. So it was a it was a really kind of strange coincidence um, that kind of brought us, I don't know, it, it grounded us, but it also kind of reminded us um, of this like cycle of coming and going um like more guide there you know like it's always a coming and returning um yeah so i don't know if i answered your question but i hope i did <laughs> we have time for one final really really good one who's gonna, do you want to duke it out between the two <laughs> who's gonna get it we can take both we can take both <laughs> questions I'll say and I'll answer your questions. What would it take for this to be shown at the White House? I don't know. I think it would be timely. You know, Obama did make a trip to Southeast Asia several years ago, and he actually made um, a commitment to... um, to to funding a lot of the demining that's happening. I don't know if he's come through with his promise, but he did make a big promise. Come through with any promises? Mm-hmm. Uh, <coughs> Lady Di's son is also very involved with mining. Just as a is there a question? Um, <laughs> where can one see this film if one isn't in New York? When if one isn't in New York. Um, 
I'm not sure. It's not going to be. Screening near me in an exhibition a, to come. Maybe, maybe. Um, we're in talks with other kind of, um, what are they called? Like screening. Distributors. N- n- like online streaming, service. streaming services. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I can't, I'm not allowed to say yet. So hopefully that'll come through soon. And has it been entered into film festivals? It has been into a couple of film festivals, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Suzanne. Maybe we can can we let Suzanne ask? Yeah, me? yes. I've uh, no Suzanne's right there in the orange hat. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, th- uh, first of all, brilliant, tender, compassionate film. So congratulations. Well, thank you, Suzanne. Um my question is, um, this is a maybe a sign of my ignorance, <laughs> not having lived in this country for a long time. But um, I was quite alarmed uh, because I, it was my understanding that NATO had considered the use of cluster bombs to be illegal and not allowed in international relations. So when President Biden allowed cluster bombs to be <coughs> shipped to the Ukraine, yeah. um, I was astounded. And I wondered how, two things, how you feel about that, and knowing, of course, as you do, and as we're seeing, what the damage of cluster bombs can do to a nation to this day, 50 years after the war. Um, Do you see your film as a vehicle to educate? Because as I'm talking to my friend Wendy, I see that a lot of Americans perhaps do not know or understand what cluster bombs have done in Vietnam. So, yeah. (laughs) Thank you for that question. So there was a treaty that was signed um, by many, many nations to ban cluster bombs, the usage of cluster bombs during during warfare. Um, But there were several countries that did not sign that treaty. And I don't remember all of them, but I know that the US, China, and Vietnam did not sign that treaty. Um, And where, Russia? Russia. Cluster munitions are a horrific invention. Um, They're designed to maim people, keep them alive, but completely like disable them um, from you know, performing their 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 kind of bodily functions and you know, like move around, but there. I know that numbers are kind of weird. I I don't like numbers too much. They they become abstract. But I'm just gonna give you share with you these numbers. Um, Fifteen million tons of ordnance was used um, during the American War in Vietnam. Uh, particularly in this area in the central region of Vietnam, and it kind of overlaps into Laos and Cambodia. Um, that's three times as many ordnance that was used in World War One and World War Two combined. Three times World War One and World War Two combined. Um, one out of three bombs did not explode. So that's five million tons of ordnance still left in the ground. My conversations with some of the NGOs, um, they they're still doing the demining work, but they're 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 turning their focus a lot onto education. That's that's where Hov and Lai comes into play to educate young kids because they know that even in the next one hundred years, they will not be able to clear the land of all the munitions that are still kind of embedded just right below the surface uh, of the land. And what has happened is that during peacetime, and we're 50 years, um, almost 50 years after the end of the American war in Vietnam, more people have been injured and have died because of UXO during peacetime than the number of American active military duty soldiers during the war. So that's the, the paradox of, of of UXO and that's the paradox of war because it, we think that you know when we pull the troops back from Afghanistan or wherever that the war is done but it's not really done it'll continue um, yeah and I, 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 
it is really helpful and important to hear and kind of grapple with those numbers. And I think part of the impact of this film and your work is that you show, you like really, again, like offer this opportunity for people to understand that impact in a way that I'm hoping numbers also convey, but um, something else happens when you kind of sit with it, you know, in this other way that I think your work is very much committed to doing. Um, so thank you for spending the evening with me. Thank you, Vivian, this group for here. everything. Thank you to the team at the New Museum. Thank you all for coming. I want to I want to make sure people have a chance to um, go back into the galleries with the time that's left and um, get to also see this work kind of in the context of these other pieces. For those who are able to take stairs, there's also um, three mobiles along the staircase and another related sculpture called Shattered Arms that's in the um, little niche that we have between the third and fourth floor. So I hope you have a chance to visit the show. Thank you. Thank you, Tuan. Thank you.